I am Lai Leong. I'm a fellow at the Center. I'm also the program director for the Article II Society. Article II, of course, being the uh, section in the U.S. Constitution that refers to the powers of the presidency. Um, the Article II Society is our donor society. Um, the, the people who are members of the society are generously, uh, make their general support make it possible for us uh, to hold events like this one. Um, and bring renowned historians uh, for the, to, to speak to us. Um, their support makes it possible for us to have postdoctoral fellows um, at the center. It makes it possible for us to provide scholarships uh, for undergrads uh, to go on study trips. Um, and we're very grateful um, for their uh, continuing uh, support. And you might have seen their, uh, their names on the slide uh, up there earlier uh, as we're waiting for the event to begin. Um, in, in honor of their support, we, uh, we, we organize uh, exclusive events uh, such as uh, casual conversations over coffee uh, with our postdoctoral fellows to talk about their work. Um, and, and often it's about their manuscripts that are about to go to press. Uh, so so uh, our, our, our Christian Society members get to hear, get, to get a sort of pre preview uh, of, of books that are going to be published. Um, and they get uh, first dips at signing up for our summer trips. Uh, in fact, there's one coming up uh, in June. If you haven't already heard Jeff Engel talk about it, um, uh, it's, it's going to focus on uh, World War I. Um, so if you, if you are interested, please, uh, please do uh, uh, look into that. That's on our website. Of course, you can talk to uh, Jeff Engel. That's it, he's right here. <laughs> um, and. Uh, um, and if you're interested in, 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 in joining uh, the society, please feel free to uh, come talk to me, I'll be around, uh, or to talk to Rana, Rana's back there. Uh, no disrespect to Jeff Engel, but Rana's the one who really makes the center run. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and I hope you enjoy the evening. Thank you for coming. You know, what's funny is you all laughed when she said Ron is in charge, but I never realized anybody ever doubted that. <laughs> so, nonetheless, uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Lai, for telling us more about the Article II Society. If you are interested, please let us know. Um, I will very ungraciously and um, not subtly point out that, hey, you know, the end of the year is coming. Uh, so you might want to get your taxes for next year all set with your donations. Uh, we really appreciate that. And I do want to highlight one thing uh, from the long list that uh, Lai mentioned, because it'll give us a good sense of how we should understand our formal introducer tonight. As you know, one of the great gems of our program, I think the crown jewel in fact, is our postdoctoral program. We bring the best postdoctoral students, uh, well they're not students anymore, graduates, postdoctoral graduates doctors. We bring doctors uh, onto campus for two years in order to, well, first to exhale after finishing their PhD, and also to work on their first book. Now, actually, I think this is actually the most intellectually vibrant time a scholar can have. They've just finished maybe eight to ten years of graduate school. Their project consumed them for the last three, four years of that, and then they get a chance to think about what their project actually means and turn it into a book. And we have been very fortunate, though I would not say surprised, that our graduates have published with some of the best presses in the world. We have quite the list. We have from Harvard, from Oxford, from Princeton, from Cornell. Uh, I don't think we have a Yale yet, but I guess, oh, yes, we do, sorry. Oh, we have Yaleese. Yeah, anyway. Um, I did my postdoc at Yale, and it was fun but apparently they're not good enough to publish our books. So in any event, one of the books that we have coming out is from uh, Cecily Zander, who is going to be doing the introduction and then moderating the conversation tonight. She comes to us from the University of Virginia and then got her PhD from uh, Penn State University. And her book was just uh, formally accepted for publication by Louisiana State University Press. Now, as a Civil War historian, there, and a Civil War military historian in particular, and a Civil War military Western historian in particular, there is actually no other press in the country that would be as good as LSU. So we could not be more pleased and more proud that there's gonna be another book to add to the list. And it gives me therefore great pride in order to introduce Cecily who will handle things from here. Thank you.
Thank you, everybody. Welcome. I'm actually just going to do an introduction because uh, Dr. Gallagher and Dr. Wad don't need a, a moderator. They've got a, a routine ready to go for us. So I'm just going to quickly handle the intros uh, here. It's wonderful to see everyone tonight, and it's great to welcome Dr. Gallagher and Dr. Wa uh, here to SMU. Uh, Dr. Gallagher, I think I met, uh, it'll be a decade ago this January, as an undergraduate in his history course at the University of Virginia, where he spent much of his career as the John L. Now the Third Professor of Civil War Era History, uh, now emeritus. Dr. Gallagher is not a Southerner, though I think he would say by both birth and inclination he's a Westerner, uh, California and Colorado, as well as time here in Texas. He did his PhD just down the road from us here in Dallas at the University of Texas at Austin where he also worked at the Lyndon Johnson Presidential Library for many years uh, before he came back to his true love, the 19th century history, the superior century uh, of American history, um, and wrote and edited more than uh, I mean, several dozen influential books uh, in the history of the Civil War, two of which I'll mention, which are staples of graduate student comprehensive exam lists, uh, as well as being some of the best and most important books uh, written on the Civil War in the last three decades, the Union War and the Confederate War. If you haven't read those, uh, they're more than worth your time. Uh, when I think of Dr. Joan Waugh, a Randy Newman song often comes to mind, and, and just stick with me here, uh, it's I Love L.A., uh, because Dr. Waugh is in fact a triple Bruin, a three-time graduate of the University of California at Los Angeles, where she also spent her career teaching what I think are some of the luckiest students in the entire University of California uh, system. If I had any eligibility left, I would transfer to UCLA, because uh, I regret that I never got to take your Gilded Age course. Um, Dr. Waugh is an expert in American reform, politics, and 19th century history, and for my money has written the best biography of Ulysses Simpson Grant um, available that money can buy. I think it puts Ron Chernow to shame. Uh, I'll say that just outright. Um, and you'll see tonight why that's the case. Her insights into Ulysses Grant um, are stunning uh, and phenomenal. And uh, I don't think I could give uh, much more of a positive introduction than that, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gallagher and Dr. Waugh, um, and thank you all for coming. I'm going to turn my microphone on and make sure, yes, this is on. Well, thank you, Cecily, for that marvelous introduction. I hope we'll be able to live up to it. We were delighted to be asked by the Center for Presidential History to talk about Reconstruction. I want to also thank Jeffrey Engel, Brian Franklin, Rana Spitz, and Cecily Zander for making this happen. The post-Civil War years have generated a huge and often contentious literature. And tonight, with our limited time, because trust me, we could go on for hours, we will be able to focus on just a few aspects of this marvelous topic. We will talk for about 50 minutes, after which we hope to have a lively give and take with all of you. Our discussion will focus on three broad questions. Number one, should reconstructions be framed as a quote unquote lost moment when the nation failed to make good on the possibility of achieving full political, legal, and social equality for four million freed people? Number two, how should the three presidents who took an active role in reconstruction be assessed? And three, how has Reconstruction played out in our national memory? I'm going to offer just a couple of bits of framing before we go on, one chronological and one geographical. A lot of the writing about Reconstruction posits a long Reconstruction. Now, we have long everythings now in the scholarly world, a long 19th century that goes from the 18th century to the 20th century, long this and long that. Uh, there's a long version of Reconstruction that goes through the 19th century and Jim Crow and into the mid-20th century in the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, there's also some work now on what has been deemed the first Reconstruction, which covers African-American political activity from the Revolution to the outbreak of Civil War. Such framing robs the actual Reconstruction era 
of its unique quality. Presidential proclamations and other actions, congressional legislation, and the three landmark constitutional amendments pertinent to restoring the Union and handling an array of issues raised by the war in its aftermath all took place between 1863 and 1877. And we're going to adhere to that chronological, uh, you might say, reality tonight rather than a longer one. Geographically, Reconstruction had a very specific meaning for the generation that experienced it. It had a central question, and that question was, how are the 11 southern slave-holding states, having been defeated on the battlefield, going to be brought back into the Union, and on what terms? A very important but secondary question, a subset of that, was how would African American rights be addressed during this process? of restoring the Union. There's been a good deal of work over the last uh, some years on reconstruction in the West, reconstruction in the northern states and so forth. Those topics, it seems to us, are part of United States history during reconstruction. And we think it, as opposed to reconstruction history, it's U.S. history during this period. We think that it's counterproductive to conflate U.S. history as a whole with reconstruction. California didn't need to be reconstructed. Neither did Colorado or Nevada or other places that never left the Union, and never mind uh, the loyal northern states, which certainly didn't need to be reconstructed. I am beginning with the question, was there a lost moment? The current dominant take on Reconstruction, and most recently shown in uh, uh, Henry Louis Gates's PBS series on Reconstruction, is that it represented a lost moment when the white North, having defeated the slaveholders' rebellion and killed slavery, abandoned its commitment to provide full political and social equality for black Americans in the wake of Appomattox. You have to understand that every generation have, of historians have to find something new to write about, some new slant. And now it, it's a very good question. Was it a lost moment? And we have put together a slideshow, or rather I did, because Gary doesn't do slides, or, or uh, as everyone knows. But this is, this is a wonderful uh, Thomas Nast, the great 19th century cartoonist, um, and it's entitled The Emancipation of the Negroes, uh, The Past and the Future. So here's the past, and this was representing before Reconstruction, or, or it, this was in the, the uh, uh, hopeful part of Republican Reconstruction. What would it bring a, a center on the family? That's the most important thing. Freedom in education, freedom to vote, and so forth, and so on. And this theme about a lost moment is prominent in scholarly literature. These interpretations generally rely on an analytical framework that describes the war that began on the US side as a struggle to restore the Union, but it turned into a fight that elevated emancipation to a position alongside saving the Union as an equivalent war aim. And when the Confederate state collapsed in the spring of 1865, positioned the nation finally to move on toward true racial equality. The subsequent failure of the white North to follow through on the last of these goals goes a common argument that is reflected in the PBS documentary and many other works, allowed a moment of national promise to slip away. Doomed black people in the South to decades of brutal Jim Crow governance and delayed achievement of African-American legal, political, and social equality until the second half of the 20th century. Now, there's been many studies over past, the past several decades reflecting this framing. We highlight three, uh, although we could, we could highlight 300 for you, but we're not going to do that. One a great and very influential book is by Heather Cox Richardson. Her Death of Reconstruction, Race, Labor, and Politics in the Post-Civil War North, published in 2001, posits a major change during the war in terms of white northern attitudes toward black people. Quote, despite their initial post-war support for freed people, states Richardson, northerners had turned against African Americans by the turn of the century. That would be 1900. In 2005, Edward J. Blum 
published Reforging the White Republic, Race, Religion, and American Nationalism, 1865 to 1898. And Blum asked this, how did the beautiful dreams of the mid-1860s devolve into the hellish nightmares of the 1890s? And why did Northern whites, he continued, reconcile with their former opponents and discard their concerns for protection and justice for people of color? Reforging the white republic, Blum argues, traces the tragedy that followed the Civil War. Finally, Eric Foner's Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution, 1863 to 1867, published in 1988, which really is the standard treatment of the subject for more than 30 years. It conveys a sense of lost momentum and potential in its subtitle, Unfinished Revolution. Foner appeared in Gates's recent documentary on Reconstruction, and maybe uh, many of you know already uh, um, in that documentary, it alluded to Reconstruction as a process that in some ways has never ended. Another of the talking heads in this series on PBS spoke of the era, quote, as a shining moment, un, uh, end of quote, that eventually devolved into Jim Crow's horrors. This idea of a lost moment makes sense, we think, only if there was a credible possibility of establishing full racial equality in the aftermath of the war. An attempt to gauge that possibility raises a fundamental question, and that is what would have been necessary to commit to and then enforce to have the requisite political, military, and social policies in place and, and really put into action. I think the first thing is there would have had to be widespread agreement among the citizens of the loyal states, that is, the non-slaveholding states and the four border states that remained in the United States, Missouri, Kentucky, and Maryland, and Delaware. There would have had to be widespread agreement that victory over the Confederacy and emancipation had left the work of the war incomplete without moving on to try to guarantee full equality for freed people. And that would include, among many other things, extending the vote to African-American men. Second, success almost certainly would have required an effective and perhaps a prolonged military occupation of the former Confederate states. That is, unless the ex-rebels cheerfully accepted a, a complete change in the social relations between white and black people in the South, that's something that was absolutely not going to happen. To appreciate the scope of such an occupation, we should keep in mind that there were a million United States soldiers in the Confederacy in April 1865. And those million soldiers occupied only a very small portion of the Confederacy. Uh, at the end of the war, there were huge stretches of the former rebel states, including almost all of the territory of Texas, that contained almost no United States soldiers. A true occupation thus would have required massive congressional appropriations that would have stretched over many years. The third requisite factor would be a commitment to such an occupation could go forward only if the people of the loyal states embraced the idea of a large peacetime standing army. That acceptance would mean abandoning a deep-seated antipathy to such military forces that had been in place since the end of the Seven Years' War in 1763 and had helped create sentiment for the American Revolution. The principal reason we have a Second Amendment as people in this room know, is because the framers of the Constitution knew that their proposed republic was not going to have a standing army. The nation would rely instead on a well-regulated militia, to use the language of the amendment, that would not threaten individual liberties. And the militiamen would be expected to supply their own shoulder weapons. The government wasn't even going to supply weapons for them, which meant that you needed a guarantee of the right excuse me, to keep and bear arms because you would be bringing your own arm with you to your service. Let's examine very briefly each of these three elements necessary to guarantee equality for the four million freed people. The first and most important is, did most loyal Americans believe the war left any major question unresolved? And the answer to that is no, they did not. Most citizens greeted the end of fighting imbued with a sense of great accomplishment. They embraced returning citizen soldiers who had preserved the Union, vanquished slaveholding aristocrats from their point of view who had sought to sunder the Union, 
and remove slavery as a future source of sectional contention that could threaten the republic. Most people favored punishment for a few Confederate leaders, but expected the mass of former rebels to accept their defeat and re-enter the Union on the victor's terms. Here is the key. Now, when I say that sentence to my UCLA students, it's time for them to take notes, but you don't have to. Here is the key. The mass of loyal citizens always identified restoration of the Union as the war's great goal. They said this in 1861. They said it again in 1865. The free states were 98.8% white in 1860, even adding the loyal slaveholding states, Kentucky, Missouri, Maryland, and Delaware, white people constituted 95% of the population. For millions of these white people, liberty and freedom had to do with the legacy of the founders that guaranteed ordinary citizens a role in their own governance and the opportunity to rise economically. The concepts of liberty and freedom had to do in the most fundamental sense in their eyes with, uh, with the promise and value of the union. Here is another slide for your edification. It's an in-your-face election poster, but it, it tells you the union, it must and shall be preserved. Who said that originally? No, no answer. That would be Andrew Jackson. It would be many people. Yes, many people. And it's Daniel with Webster. The, for the President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln and Andrew Johnson, that unforgettable duo that was elected in 1864. Untold loyal citizens believed that a failure to save the Union would scuttle the hard and bloody work of the revolutionary generation. Beyond the North, Amer North American continent, they thought it would imperil the future of democracy in a West in a Western world that was increasingly dominated, especially since the failed European revolutions of the 1840s, by oligarchs, aristocrats, and monarchists. When Lincoln called the nation the last best hope on earth, he did so with an affirming rather than a didactic purpose. No one better understood the bedrock appeal of union across the loyal states than Abraham Lincoln, who as late as December 1864, after he and the Republicans had defeated Democrats in the November elections, offered this in his annual message to Congress, quote, in a great national crisis like ours, unanimity of action among those seeking a common end is very desirable, almost indispensable, in this case, Lincoln stated, the common end is the maintenance of the Union. The proposed 13th Amendment to end slavery, which the ballots in November proved to be favored by the electorate, stood in Lincoln's words, among the means to secure the end. For most of the white North, emancipation was just what Lincoln suggested in his effort to court wide support for the war a means to the greater end of union. Apart from the small number of abolitionists and some radical Republicans, white citizens, including many Democrats, inside and some outside the army, embraced emancipation for several reasons. Killing slavery would help defeat the Confederacy. It would punish slave-holding oligarchs who had precipitated this war in the first place. And it would re remove the only internal factor anyone could imagine threatening the Union going forward. All these reasons had to do with Union, restoring it and making it safe for the future rather than with mounting a great moral crusade to destroy a hateful institution and help African Americans. At the end of the war, with the Union salvaged, and emancipation accomplished, most loyal citizens believed that, that they had taken care of everything, despite how we believe today. There was no groundswell of support for doing more, for pursuing social justice and legal uh, rights for freed people that would necessitate maintaining a massive military presence in the former Confederacy. For most of the loyal citizenry, Emancipation marked the end of a story featuring issues relating to slavery as a 
as a destructive element in American political life, not the beginning of a story that would move on to full racial equality. For them, the real beginning after Appomattox was for a newly restored nation, an emerging economic colossus, liberated from the sectionalism that had long threatened the work of the founders. Lincoln's proposals, Lincoln's proposals for Reconstruction, which came out in the midst of the war, of course, during uh, wartime debates about Reconstruction, aligned well with the widespread agreement among the citizenry of the United States that Union stood as the conflict's paramount goal. United States victories at Gettysburg and at Vicksburg and at Chattanooga between July and late November 1863 suggested that the Confederacy was approaching defeat and led Lincoln to consider offering his initial thoughts about how Reconstruction would play out. And he did that on December 8, 1863, with his proclamation, as he called it, of amnesty and Reconstruction. Under its terms, when 10% of any Confederate state's 1860 voting population took an oath of allegiance to the United States and accepted all the congressional actions and presidential proclamations then in place regarding emancipation, Whenever those two criteria were met, that state could write a new constitution and hold elections to establish a state government. This became known as Lincoln's 10% plan, and it was grounded in the president's constitutional power to grant reprieves and pardons. Lincoln hoped that this plan would hasten, both hasten the demise of the Confederacy by bringing people who were wavering in support of the Confederacy over to the notion that they might be, at our, be better off in the Union, and in doing that, speed the restoration of the Union. And before the end of the war, Louisiana and Arkansas and Tennessee and Virginia had created governments that met Lincoln's template. His plan sparked a major pushback in Congress among members of his own party as well as others. Hard for us to imagine the executive and the congressional parts of our government uh, arguing about whether proclamations or legislation is more important. Uh, actually, nothing's new in our history, as all of you know. That's one of the hardest things to get students to understand. You think this is new? It really isn't new. You just don't know why it isn't new yet. A contentious debate ensued with congressional Republicans, mostly of the radical wing, insisting first that Lincoln's terms were too lenient toward rebels and didn't include enough guarantees for freed people, and second, that Congress, not the president, should be the, one, the part of government deciding how Reconstruction was going to be framed. This is something Congress should do, not that you should do as president. In July and August 1864, leaders in Congress proposed, among other things, that the baseline should be 50% of the 1860 voting populations in any of these states, a percentage that, of course, almost no one could imagine happening in these states in the Confederacy. But they also said that Lincoln should stick to his role of executing laws passed by Congress and not trying to pretend he was making laws through presidential proclamations. Well, Lincoln used a pocket veto to kill a crucial, pe a crucial piece of legislation that laid out far tougher terms for the rebel states. This infuriated other radicals in Congress. He didn't, he just let it die. You all know what a pocket veto does. He just let it die. And Congress, in retaliation, refused to seat congressional delegations from the states under governments established under Lincoln's guidelines. This standoff anticipated later clashes between Congress and Andrew Johnson. In the meantime, on April 11th, 1865, just four days before John Wilkes Booth assassinated him, Lincoln gave remarks that promised a new statement regarding Reconstruction. He wasn't specific about it, but he did make clear that he would consider supporting giving the vote to USCT veterans, United States Colored Troops veterans, and also to some other African American men. One of the people in the audience uh, who heard Lincoln say this was John Wilkes Booth, and John Wilkes Booth wrote that that was the, when Lincoln said he was gonna do that regarding black men voting, that's when he decided that he needed to kill Abraham Lincoln. How Lincoln would have dealt with Congress going forward, of course, we will never know. Uh, we can chat about it uh, in the question and answer part of this, but that is where we leave Lincoln. His last statement about Reconstruction is four days before his death. We're going to switch back and forth with different amounts of time each time, and if you really find yourself fidgety when one of us is talking, just relax. 
whoever's talking will stop. No, it will person, end. <laughs> and the other person will start. And there's Abraham Lincoln. He appeared while I was talking and I didn't even notice. Joan loves to torment me about this kind of stuff. I just am hopelessly uh, a Luddite in that regard. But there he is. Uh, there's Abraham Lincoln looking over our shoulder. Attitudes in the North, I think it's important to keep in mind, regarding black enfranchisement, often didn't even rise to the level that Lincoln had laid out, prospectively, on April 11th. And that illuminates this, this absence of a sense of urgency uh, among the loyal citizenry of the United States in terms of equal political rights is, shows up very well in that. In 1865, there were only five northern states that gave the full franchise to black men, all in New England. And you'll know which ones they are when I'll tell you Connecticut wasn't one of them. Uh, but the other five that were were in New England. That year, referenda to expand the vote to black men failed in Minnesota and in Wisconsin and in Connecticut. Over the next three years, similar referenda in New York, in Ohio, in Kansas, and in Nebraska territory also yielded negative results. By 1868, more than three years after Appomattox, only Minnesota, where a second referendum was successful, and Iowa had joined the five New England states in extending the franchise to black men. Now, I'm, I mentioned earlier we're going to have different periods where we're talking. I'm going to keep talking for a minute, but just know Joan will be back. Will up. it ever end? Yes. <laughs> what about the second of the three requirements to guarantee equal rights? That is, was there a consensus that military occupation should follow defeat of the Confederacy? We've already tipped our hand here. Uh, the opposite prevailed. There was absolutely no enthusiasm for keeping anybody in the army. Both soldiers in uniform and civilians back home pressed for a rapid demobilization of United States forces. Their thought was these forces had put in the field to accomplish one thing, and that is suppress the rebellion. The rebellion is suppressed. Slavery is also dead. Bring the soldiers home. It's always crucial to keep in mind the difference between the small, regular United States Army, which never numbered even 30,000 men during the Civil War, and the vast army of citizen soldiers who mustered into federal service during the war, specifically for this crisis. The Union Army on May 1st, 1865, numbered about a million citizen soldiers. 800,000 of them were mustered out by November. 800,000 already out of uniform by November. One year later, 11,000 remained in uniform. Out of a million, 11, that's one of the most rapid demobilizations after a major conflict in history. This demobilization reflected the nearly universal sentiment that the war had accomplished its goals and that no large force would be necessary going forward. I'm gonna give you testimony from one officer and one enlisted man to convey how most citizen soldiers reacted to Confederate capitulation. The first is a cavalry commander who served in William Tecumseh Sherman's army, and he was addressing, this cavalry commander was addressing his troops on August 7, 1865 in Atlanta, Georgia. Comrades, your career as soldiers is over. You are going home as citizens. I rejoice that our country is intact and united, our government stronger than ever, and that the necessity for our armed service no longer exists. William Wiley was in the 77th Illinois Infantry. His unit mustered out in Mobile, Alabama on July 10th, 1865. He wrote in his diary that day, this is a day that we have long looked forward to when we could feel that our work for which we enlisted was done. The units that didn't get to go home in the summer of 1865 were very unhappy groups of citizen soldiers. Congressional actions in the years following Appomattox highlight the absence of support for a large army of occupation in the former rebel states. And I know I'm throwing a bunch of numbers at you, and I'll, it's, you're remarkably free of, of any taint from this, but I'm going to keep you? giving you just a few more. On July 28, 1866, Congress fixed the size of the regular army, <coughs> excuse me, at 54,302 men. A number reduced in 1869 to 37,313, and in 1876 to 27,472. Until the outbreak of war with Spain in 1898, the regular army remained under 30,000 men. To put this in context, in 1890, Prussia had 600,000 
Men in uniform, France, 550,000. The United States, under 30,000 uh, at that point. Between 1866 and 1877, U.S. soldiers, and Cecily Zander has been a great help on this. Her dissertation is really something you should grab a hold of and read as a book. She's done great work on this kind of stuff. U.S. soldiers did two things before the Civil War. They garrisoned coastal installations and they waged campaigns or stood on guard against Native Americans as the, as the settlement of white settlement line moved westward. Reconstruction adds a third thing that they have to do. They have the two they've always been doing, but now they're also on reconstruction duty. And they had to divide manpower into three pieces rather than two. In 1866, for example, half of the regular army's troops carried out occupation duties in the south Half were deployed along the coast and in the west. Over the next nine years, the percentage stationed in the south dropped steadily. It was 45% in 1867, less than 10% in 1875. At its peak in 1866, one year after the war, the regular army's strength against <coughs> across the former Confederacy did not quite reach 30,000. This is the peak compared to the more than one million citizen soldiers who were there in April 1865. By 1871, the midpoint of Reconstruction, just 8,700 regulars were carrying out Reconstruction-related duties. These statistics indicate that there never was a real occupation of the Confederacy, though brutal suppression under the boot heel of Yankee soldiers was a staple of Lost Cause special pleading. 30,000 soldiers in a territory covering three quarters of a million square miles scarcely rises, we suggest, to the level of an occupation. The small size of the post-war army not only attests to a belief across the loyal states that the war had achieved its major purposes, but also highlights the continuing opposition to a large peacetime military force in the United States. Restrictions on the size of the army, to repeat, had very deep roots in long-standing American concerns a possibility about the possibility that standing armies can pose a direct threat to individual rights and liberties. Are you finished? I am finished. Okay. <laughs> For How now. did a triumphant North that thought the war had settled the big issues, cared little about African Americans, and opposed the idea of military occupations eventually arrive at a position where the 14th and 15th Amendments seem necessary? I mean, when you think of it, it is an amazing testament that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were passed during this period, which although didn't live up to their full potential, to say the least, in the late 19th century, certainly have figured hugely, especially, the, obviously, the 14th and 15th Amendments. So, but why did the 14th and 15th Amendments happen? We have this man to thank. The actions of President Andrew Johnson and events in various southern states beginning in the summer of 1865, increased support for a harder kind of reconstruction. Vice President Andrew Johnson took the oath as president on April 15, 1865, and three years later he was impeached in the U.S. House for, quote, high crimes and misdemeanors. Who would have predicted that would happen? Not anyone living at the time. And by the way, I have already been advised by certain important people connected with the Presidential Center here that Andrew Johnson is at the bottom of the presidential rankings now. It used to be U.S. Grant, but he's, he's moved up. But uh, Don't forget uh, James Buchanan. James Buchanan, I'm sorry. He hates James Buchanan. I don't know what to do. I, I don't hate him. You know, just no, no, you rant about him and, and stop it. Rant is such a harsh word. <laughs> well, anyway, why was Andrew Johnson put on the ticket with Lincoln? You saw it for yourself, the poster there. Andrew Johnson of Tennessee, the answer is he opposed secession, the only uh, Southern senator to do so. He remained loyal to the United States. He was appointed Tennessee's military governor, and during his tenure, repeatedly and enthusiastically called for emancipation and the, end, and the end of slavery, obviously. Like President Lincoln, his roots were humble, and he despised the Southern slaveholding class for their despotic hold on the common folk. 
1864, speaking to a large crowd of African Americans, he announced the end of slavery in Tennessee, also in the same speech, uh, claimed that he was their savior. Uh, an interest, a very interesting person. Then, in 1864, when the Republican Party was looking to widen its voting base, it wasn't called the Republican Party, it was the Union Party in various, and, and he, was, he was put on the ticket because he was loyal, because he supported emancipation, and also because he could appeal to a wider base of voters. The Republicans were already looking toward the end of the war and how they could establish themselves in, uh, with other, rather than northern voters, southern voters as well. So Andrew Johnson seemed like a good choice, and the radical wing of the Republican Party, Ben Wade, Charles Sumner, et cetera, et cetera, they were confident that they could work with him. But no, President Johnson was determined to follow in Lincoln's footsteps, and he wanted to set the term for Reconstruction from the White House. Uh, he believed in a limited federal government oversight of the states. Now, Congress was not in session when he assumed the presidency, so he had a delightful control of Reconstruction for eight months, creating a firestorm of protests with his actions. Here's what he did. He issued a proclamation of amnesty in May of 1865, which Lincoln may well have issued as well, but it was different when he did it. It was very sympathetic to the people that he supposedly didn't like, the Southern barons. He issued many, many pardons for ex-Confederate over the, that same summer of 1865. He came out firmly against suffrage and civil rights. And when the radical Republicans protested, he pointed out that every black suffrage bill on the ballots in the North and Midwest that came up during his presidency went down to defeat. So he accused them of being hypocrites. Still, radical Republicans and an increasing number of moderate Republicans were outraged and re troubled by reports of violence against African Americans in the former Confederate States such as the riots in Memphis, Tennessee, and New Orleans, and many, many other disturbing reports of violence against blacks and Republicans. Now, in late 1865 and early 1866, radicals, radical Republicans and moderates became convinced that like when Lincoln tried to uh, do reconstruction through executive the executive branch that they needed to take complete control of Reconstruction. They demanded that Johnson accept the 14th Amend Amendment, which gra granted citizenship to African Americans, and accept the Civil Rights Bill of 1866. Johnson refused to bend, vetoing the Civil Rights Bill, but his veto was promptly overridden. The radicals wanted to recast the South in the free labor style and establish a Southern Republican Party with the support and the votes of, of freed black men. The fall election of 1866 was the congressional elections. Um, they were cast as a mandate on president, presidential reconstruction. And the results of the voting supplied the radicals with a mandate to pursue their program. We think we are divided and angry with each other today. Trust me, this, is, this was really even worse, if you can imagine. So that's um, Johnson's presidential reconstruction was dead with a solid veto-proof Republican congressional majority. So congressional reconstruction took place from 1867 to 1877. Congress passed the Reconstruction Acts of 1867. They divided the South up. They threw out all of Johnson's uh, uh, re-entered uh, states and divided the South up into five military districts, which would be temporarily governed by a US Army general, various US Army generals, who would oversee the establishment and administration of the new states back to the Union. The acts enfranchised freedmen and ratified the 14th Amendment. Johnson, of course, was angry at this. He tried to block 
congressional reconstruction, but his vetoes were overridden. The deeply hostile relationship between the president and Congress ultimately resulted in Johnson's impeachment trial. The, uh, um, the, just probably you know this already, but the, the Republicans deliberately wanted to, to have a fight, a chance to impeach uh, Johnson, and they passed something called the Tenure of Office Act because they knew or they were worried that he wanted to fire Edwin Stanton, which he did fire Edwin Stanton. He removed him from office, and Congress then drew up articles of impeachment. It wasn't really about firing a cabinet, cabinet member, because the president has the perfect right to do that. It wouldn't have held up in the Supreme Court. It was over the meaning of the war. It was over Reconstruction. Anyway, the uh, Congress drew up the Articles of Impeachment. The country's business uh, stopped in spring of 1868 to view the drama of the impeachment trial. Johnson avoided conviction and removal from office, but now he was a lame duck president and Congress controlled Reconstruction through the rest of his term in office. And this man, who was elected in 1868, Ulysses S. Grant, the general that won the Union general that won the Civil War and directed uh, the military part of Reconstruction under Johnson, was uh, elected elected to office, and he he had the Reconstruction plan already drawn up for him and passed by Congress. Uh, general in Chief Ulysses S. Grant was in his office in the War Department in Washington, D.C. when notification of his nomination as the Republican Party's presidential candidate arrived in May 1868. He wrote a brief but heartfelt letter of acceptance endorsing the party platform. Reaching for harmony, Grant concluded his short letter with the proclamation, let us have peace, which became the slogan of the Republican presidential campaign in 1868. It meant peace between races, between parties, peace between North and South. Like President Lincoln, whom he absolutely worshiped, Grant was an ardent reconciliationist and a firm supporter of civil rights for freed people and suffrage for black men. He had been since he was tasked as the commanding general in the West and then the commanding general of all the armies with overseeing parts of Reconstruction for both white and black Southerners. So he's very familiar with um, the issues. Uh, and so, um, I, although other issues were at play, as they always are in elections, most citizens viewed the 1868 presidential contest between Ulysses S. Grant, Republican, and Horatio Seymour of New York, Democrat, as a referendum on re Republican Reconstruction. And they, um, and they were right. It was a referendum, and Grant won handily, although not overwhelmingly. But here's the interesting thing about the election of 1868. Republicans were aware that the black vote was critical to the, tr the triumph of the Grant ticket. And as a matter of fact, I think it was about 400,000 black men voted in this, uh, in this election and was critical. During the campaign on July 9th, 1868, the 14th Amendment was ratified and the 15th Amendment went to the states. When Grant was elected in 1868, congressional Republicans uh, were uh, believed that they had a solid friend in the White House, and over the, for the most part, they were, they were proved to be correct. Over the course of his first term, Grant proudly signed off on the 15th Amendment, and this is another one of those wonderful posters that are great teaching aids showing the, all the benefits of the 15th Amendment of voting. You would never... Uh, um, think that, that the right of suffrage would bleed over into so many aspects of life, but it, that's how it was portrayed. And, and so that is, uh, Grant was very moved to be able to do this. He supported the 14th Amendment, he supported the 15th Amendment, and he said this in a special message to the American people, quote, 
the adoption of the 15th Amendment to the Constitution completes the great civil change and constitutes the most important event that has occurred since the nation came into life. In 1872, he broke the spine of the, K, the KKK and other terrorist organizations that were committing terrible acts of election violence against African Americans and office holders. Uh, <clears throat> he declared martial law and made mass arrests. His administration de created the Department of Justice to continue doing this. He, he lobbied for and, and was able to pass through Congress the Enforcement Act which stopped the Klan terror. Uh, but uh, Grant also was, was following in Lincoln's footsteps by, by also reaching out to as many ex-Confederate whites who would, be, who would join the Union. And so in 1870, uh, the saw six former Confederate states rejoin the nation under the Reconstruction Act, and that's where the tension is for an historian. At the same time, the Republicans are doing this, they're doing that. So they're, they're promoting African American rights, in, in, particularly in the South, uh, for suffrage and civil rights, but they also want to demobilize the army, they want to get the nation back reunited. So, so that that's, was, that's an interesting part of this dynamic. In the, in the South, the Republicans were a foreign entity, right? I mean, the Republican Party was not natural. So they, they needed the support of three groups in the South to make this a go during Reconstruction. The first group was comprised of northern whites that came south during, uh, during the war. They're, they're uh, to some extent, unfairly called carpetbaggers. But these men were often uh, Union soldiers, Freedmen Bureau, uh, Freedmen's Bureau agents, businessmen, and teachers. They provided the, the core of leadership for the Republican Party. The second group was made up of small um, southern whites sympathetic to the Union during the war and really wanting to see what the northern uh, nation could do for the economy of the South, because they were the losers in the plantation economy. Some of, they were called scalawags by their fellow <laughs> white southerners, and they were a very small group. Uh, African Americans formed the third and largest group in this Republican coalition throughout states like Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama and Virginia, and they comprised 80% of the Republican vote. So this is kind of an extraordinary moment. I mean, this is one of the most uh, uh, progressive experiments in racial uh, equality that the, certainly anyone in the world, according to Eric Foner, has ever attempted. So that is, um, leads me to the next slide, which is another Thomas Nass favorably portraying how African Americans for a while um, really under congressional reconstruction and with the support of Ulysses S. Grant and the protection of the United States Army, freedmen joined Nat union leagues, which were voting groups, uh, Republican voting groups, voted enthusiastically, engaged in all kinds of political actions, and were elected to all levels of government throughout the South. But uh, as you probably are aware of, the depressed Southern economy could not be revived. This is a, sh a very condensed version. And the region suffered from dire po poverty throughout the Reconstruction, and of course, well beyond 1877. The ex-slaves had hoped for land reform almost more than the vote, but instead set had to settle for sharecropping, a, la a labor arrangement that favored cotton planters. Meanwhile, the Republican coalition was coming apart under relentless pr pressure from white Democrats. Southerners railed against black Republicanism, they called it, and fought against quote unquote Negro rule. When white Southerners regained control of their state governments, they immediately removed African Americans from office and did whatever possible to deny black voters their voice in politics. So again, you had this strange dynamic work where at the same time, Republicans needed 
the, uh, the black vote to retain their national presence in the government, they also were bringing back in reconciliation more and more Confederate men into the voting pools. And this, this is really extraordinary when you think about it. So they, um, by 1874, the federal government and the northern people be, began to tire of the continual fight to reconstruct their former foes. Other issues, scandals, the Indian Wars, begin to draw attention and energy away from southern problems. And of course, the big one was the Depression of 1873, the first major industrial depression in our history. And it was terrible. And that brought back the Democrats into power in 1874 when they took the House of Representatives and Reconstruction was over. And, and it was, <clears throat> by 1876, only three Republican governments remained in the South, Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. Those of you who uh, are aware of the exciting election of 1876 will know that it was marred by fraud, backroom deals that allowed Republican Rutherford B. Hayes of Ohio to take the White House over the Democrat Samuel T Tilden of New York. By eight, April 1877, redemption, it was called, was complete, and all of the states of the former Confederacy were again under democratic rule. Grant's slogan for his 1868 election, let us have peace, would have many different reverberations through his two terms, as I've tried to make clear. President Grant to, uh, stood firm with the Republican Party in making sure that union victory was secured on northern terms, restoring the rights and privileges of white southerners, but he also strove to protect the rights and establish the citizenship of the free, freed people. He would struggle to do justice to both, but failed in his aims for reconstruction for the formerly enslaved of the South. It was an uneasy reconciliation, you can describe it as, but, um, but that's, that's what happened. During his eight years of president, Grant was attacked for his reconstruction plan relentlessly, first by, you might imagine, white Democrats of the North who wanted him to lose, and that was a good uh, <clears throat> cudgel for them to use, but also white Democrats of the South. And he was called a dictator and a despot for sending troops to interfere with elections, as I called it, election violence, uh, especially Louisiana was famous for that. And his own party in 1872 of disaffected liberal Republicans, many of whom were abolitionists, uh, uh, broke with him in 18, broke with the Republicans to support Southern home rule. They said enough is enough. We need to get on with civil service reform. That was their big issue. Um, and it must be said that as somebody who's written not a, a strict biography of U.S. Grant, but one that locates him in memory and how he was, his reputation was interpreted over the, the generations. Uh, I would have to say his historical repu uh, reputation was deeply stained by these, these attacks coming from the white South, coming from those people who were champions of the lost cause, this romantic idea of the South uh, <clears throat> in the Civil War and its legacy, and taken up by many Northerners as well. And so that's, um, there, there are lots, there's lots to talk about in his eight year, it is two terms in office, but that's what really, uh, really, st one of the things that really stained his historical reputation. He was a butcher during the war who only won because he threw men, uh, uh, endless numbers of Union soldiers to the death, and then he was a corrupt uh, despot during Reconstruction. And Joan has set us up to move into memory. We'll finish by talking a little bit about Reconstruction in American historical memory. And it won't come as a surprise to any of you to know that it has figured far less prominently in our national memory than the Civil War has. It's not even close. A dozen years of intricate political maneuvering and racial strife 
and simmering violence uh, in the Reconstruction years never caught the national imagination, as did a seismic conflict uh, replete with famous battles and generals and a political landscape featuring the most beloved president in our history. Uh, the United States, for example, the government has issued three sets of Civil War stamps. The first during the centennial years in 1961 to 1965. The second in 1994 in response to no anniversary whatsoever of any kind, just time for some more Civil War stamps. And then the third during the sesquicentennial years of 2011 to 2015. There's no equivalent postal commemoration of Reconstruction, not even a hint of anything equivalent. Everybody in this audience knows that there are many Civil War battlefield sites, and they're visited by a lot of people every year, overseen by the National Park Service. Uh, Gettysburg and Vicksburg, Antietam, Shiloh, Chickamauga, among the most famous of them. Uh, for Reconstruction, there's the Reconstruction Era National Historical Park in Beaufort County, South Carolina, which was dedicated in 2017. And there's the Andrew Johnson National Historical Site in Greenville, Tennessee. Visitation at the Civil War sites uh, far exceeds the very modest numbers who seek out the Reconstruction sites. To a remarkable extent, former rebels saw their version of Reconstruction become the national version of Reconstruction which was a period of oppressive military occupation of a defeated white South that created corrupt politics uh, shaped by radical Republicans in Congress and overseen by a coalition of the carpetbaggers and scalawags and their African-American allies in the former Confederate States. The heroes in this version of Reconstruction often were the Ku Klux Klan and other forces that helped restore democratic white supremacy through the implementation of Jim Crow's social, legal, and political strictures. Former Confederate General Clement A. Evans captured this interpretation of the period by deploring what he called, quote, the tragedy, pathos, corruption, and absurdities of the military dictatorship and of Reconstruction. The post-war era thought Evans had been marked by, quote, topsy-turvy conditions generally, domestic upheaval, Negroes voting, disorder on plantations, the Ku Klux, and red shirts. Put simply, Evans and those who shared his perspective detested the North's forcing unwelcome changes, however uh, fleetingly, in the former slaveholding states' racial structures. We'll finish by looking at how two kinds of things have affected how Americans look at Reconstruction, how they have shaped perceptions of Reconstruction, that is, some critical publications that have come out from historians, and then at how Hollywood uh, has done its part to help people try to misunderstand, uh, in quotation, <laughs> the past. Hollywood's really good at that. Anybody who's seen JFK or The Patriot uh, knows that Hollywood can do more damage in one, two hours of running time than historians can correct in a lifetime. Well, I get the exciting part, the books. <laughs> So I'm going, to, I'm going to single out five books that merit special attention in this regard. William Archibald Dunning, a fine name if there ever was one, he wrote, published a book called Reconstruction, Political and Economic, 1865 to 1877 in 1907. And he set a long-standing standard for survey treatments. William Dunning was a professor at Columbia University, and he directed a series of dissertations that became books devoted to Reconstruction in, in specific states. And these books were marked by sharp criticism, or united by sharp criticism, of the Republican regimes in the South and paternalistic or an outright race, racist treatment of African Americans. And the Dunning School monographs, as they came to be called, sold relatively few copies, but nonetheless shaped generations of college and secondary school instruction about Reconstruction. A far more influential and perhaps toxic treatment appeared in 1929, Claude G. Bowers, The Tragic Era, The Reconstruction After Lincoln, fit comfortably within the sensational tradition of Thomas Dixon's brutally racist novel, The Klansman, and D.W. Griffith's film, The Birth of a Nation. Bowers was a Democrat who hoped his book would bolster his party's strength. 
The tragic era had, had a first printing, wait for it, of 100,000 copies and was selected by the Literary Guild, went through 12 subsequent, subsequent printings. Reprinted in paper back for the college market in 1862, it went through several more printings. And here is the typical quotation, quote, then came the scum of northern society, emissaries of the politicians, soldiers of fortune, and not a few degenerates. It was not until the original clan began to ride that white Southerners felt some sense of security. Six years later, W.E.B. Du Bois published Black Reconstruction in America, 1935, a massive study that directly challenged the Dunning School and more especially the tragic era. Playing off Bauer's title, Du Bois found tragedy he found tragedy in Reconstruction too, but of a far, far different kind. The tragedy was, quote, that the reconstruction of the southern states from slavery to free labor and from aristocracy to industrial democracy was not conceived as a major national program of America, whose accomplishment at any price was well worth the effort. Had the nation embraced this view, argued Du Bois, Quote, we should be living in a different world. Although it anticipated many of the themes in later Reconstruction scholarship, black Reconstruction was largely ignored when it appeared and was not even reviewed by the American Historical Review. Kenneth M. Stamps, The Era of Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877, published in 1865, marked a dramatic shift that heralded a revisionist flood of books and articles that, in scholarly circles at least, completely discredited the Dunning interpretation. Long the staple assigned reading in college classrooms, Stamp held sway as the obvious survey of, of the period of Reconstruction until the publication in 1989 of Eric Foner's Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution, a masterful synthesis of a quarter century scholarship. Foner's book remains, after more than 30 years, the most influential book on the subject. Very influential, but not nearly as influential as what happens on the silver screen. The work of historians surely has molded public perceptions about Reconstruction and filtered down uh, in many ways over the years, but nothing that any historian has written approaches the cultural influence of two Hollywood blockbusters. The Birth of a Nation, directed by D.W. Griffith and uh, released in 1915, offered a sprawling narrative that idealized the Old South and the Confederacy, <clears throat> Excuse me, and white Gary. southerners during Reconstruction. I don't want to mention that yet. I'm saving that for. Well, you exactly. told me I didn't. I now, didn't point out the picture. <laughs> I know when I want to use it, and it isn't yet. It's oh. a perfect moment to use it. No, leave it there. But I don't want to talk about it yet. <laughs> you, you tell me when you want to talk. About I want it right now. Thank you. <laughs> now, don't pay attention to that. <laughs> it's there, but it's only background. <laughs> I'll never guess. <laughs> With Thomas Dixon's novel, The Klansman, as its guiding text, the film originally carried that title. It was going to be called The Klansman. But when Dixon watched it for the first time at a private screening in New York City in early 1915, he decided that The Klansman wasn't a suitable title for a film of such power. And he told uh, D.W. Griffith, quote, it should be called The Birth of a Nation. It's just too big an issue here. Well, in his story of Reconstruction, Griffith offered a character based on Thaddeus Stevens. He's named Austin Stoneman in The Birth of a Nation, who torments white Southerners. He sits around just imagining how to torment white Southerners. It also features, features vile United States soldiers, including African-American soldiers who terrorized former Confederate men and menace white women, while carpetbaggers, scalawags, and their black politician allies make a mockery of government in the former Confederacy. In the end, only the Ku Klux Klan brings order and correct uh, 
social uh, situations to the south. There are these scenes, there's one scene where the Klan really extending to the, as far as you can see in the background, rides toward the viewer. This is at the very end of the film, where the Klan and the white women the Klan has saved a ride through town. Birth of a Nation played to large audiences throughout the United States. It is not a regional film. Its racist message prompted outrage in some places outside the old Confederacy, as when a reviewer in the New Republic pronounced it an aggressively vicious and defamatory uh, piece of filmmaking. But it generated its largest profits not in the South, but in the North and in the West, where patrons likely were dazzled by Griffith's technical skill and masterful staging and little bothered by his racism. Birth of a Nation remained in theatrical release until 1948 in parts of the United States, and it earned in the end, when you adjust for inflation, more than a billion dollars. Producer David O. Selznick's Gone with the Wind, our timing was perfect that time, and here it is, <laughs> a poster for Gone with the Wind. Uh, it replaced Birth of a Nation, it ended the Birth of a Nation's reign as the most influential and profitable cinematic expression of the Confederate view of Reconstruction. It also grossed more than a billion dollars in the long term. These two movies were incredibly successful. Sels Selznick's epic almost certainly has been the single most powerful influence on how Americans perceive the Civil War and perhaps to a slightly lesser degree, Reconstruction had a record-breaking first release. It already had all those people who'd read the Pulitzer Prize-winning novel, which came out in 1936. There's a built-in audience there, but it far extended that audience. First release in 1939. It had several subsequent major national releases as a film. And of course, because Ted Turner loves it, has a continuing impact on television. It's on regularly. Uh, even now. Gone with the Wind echoed the birth of a nation in many ways, though Selznick replaced Griffith's blatant racism with a more paternalistic treatment of African-American characters, most notably uh, Hattie McDaniel's uh, character uh, in the film. As in Birth of a Nation, the end of the war brings a new kind of vulture to the ruined South, and Gone with the Wind has occasional blocks of text, as you all know, that tells you what's coming on. This is what one says. The tattered cavaliers came hobbling home back to the desolation that had once been a land of grace and plenty. Another invader, more cruel and vicious than any they had fought, the carpetbaggers awaited them. A white man and a black man in a carriage, with, literally with a carpet bag next to their side to remind even the dullest theater goer of what was going on, <laughs> uh, ride along a path strewn with worn out Confederate veterans singing the two in the carriage, not the Confederate veterans, marching through Georgia as they go along. It's a wonderful uh, scene that gets right at uh, what Thomas Dixon would have been happy with. Subsequent scenes, scenes leave no doubt that the white South must resist venal carpetbaggers, offering instances, among other things, of black people in Atlanta forcing white people off sidewalks and so forth. You've all, I'm sure most of you have seen the film and you know these scenes. Unlike Birth of a Nation, Gone with the Wind never celebrates the Ku Klux Klan or shows violence against African American characters, but an unnamed Klan-like organization does mount a raid on the Decatur Road uh, outside Atlanta, during which Scarlett's second unloved husband, Frank Kennedy, is killed, and Ashley Wilk, surely one of the weakest, most unbelievably off-putting characters in cinema, uh, is wounded. Really, Ashley Wilkes? You watch that? I, anyway. How do you really feel? <laughs> it's, I have to get that out of my mind. It was perhaps a measure of the racial temper of the times that Eleanor Roosevelt, whose credentials regarding race certainly placed her among the most progressive segment of the populace, pronounced Gone with the Wind, quote, an extraordinary movie, beautifully acted. Well, modern films take a radically different view of, of Reconstruction, presenting favorable African-American characters and white characters with progressive views. Two examples are Summersby uh, from 1993 and Free State of Jones from 2016. The only sad thing is no one sees these movies. Uh, they fall like trees in Siberia, and in the instance of Free State of Jones, that's a good thing. It's actually, you'd have to be sentenced to watch that uh, in most ways, I think. But nonetheless, 
these films reach very small audiences compared to Birth of a Nation or Gone with the Wind. And I think even now, and we'll wind up with this and then open it to all of you, I think even now residual echoes of the Dunning School interpretation retain some force in the United States, and that is due at least to a degree, I think, to that film right there. We're now open for give and take with the audience. Oh, Cecily. What are we doing? Dr. Zander says that the mic will come to you rather than your having to go to the mic. Thank you. I know that academicians and historians are very reluctant to engage in speculation. But would you speculate on how Reconstruction might have played out had Lincoln not been assassinated? That is an excellent question. Thank you. Uh, I think it would have played out very differently, and we can uh, talk about this, but I, but I don't know that at the end of the day it would have been that much better for African Americans. I think that it, that uh, if you if you think about the way he died, he was an immediate martyr. He was he was he. There's this famous uh, illustration that many historians, including myself, use when giving my lecture on the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, where he's taken up to heaven to be with George Washington, wrapping his arms around Washington. So he was untouchable. And to many, uh, even most Americans, even today, he is, he is a hero, and he, it would have been different. And in some ways, that's the lost moment, right, for many people that Lincoln died. So I, I, I think it would have been really difficult. But would he have made the same blunders as Andrew Johnson? No. He would I, I don't not have done that, it. no question. But I don't think, but Lincoln doesn't change the, the, the baseline structural elements that are in place, at least in my view. And that is that most people, they, the war's gone on four years. People want the war to be over. Most people think they've accomplished it. They don't have a list with three things on it. Union safe check, emancipation check, that will help the union go forward. There's not a third thing on that list. And whether Lincoln was president or Andrew Johnson, Lincoln was a, would have been, I think, much better in dealing with Republicans in Congress. But I don't think he would have. The fact that he was still president wouldn't, would not have made the mass of white northerners think that, OK, we're not finished with this yet. Let's, that's, it's still going to be really expensive. We're going to need a big army for a lot longer. And we're going to have to make the former rebels do what we want them to do. I just don't think the will was there. To do that, I well, just... lest we forget, the radical Republicans were uh, hated him in when he attempted his wartime reconstruction. They wanted to dump him in they, 1864. They did. They I did. mean, it's, so it's. But but it's so. I mean, we can't know. It's un, it's not answerable. Uh, but it's fun to speculate, and we in fact speculated that the first question we would get was, "What if Abraham Lincoln had lived?" <laughs> I wish I'd gotten a bet down on that. But anyway, thank you for asking the question that we hoped would be asked. It's interesting, in Birth of a Nation, I actually had to watch Birth of a Nation very carefully and take notes about it because I wrote about it in a book. It has one of the, the themes in Birth of a Nation that is that if only Lincoln had lived, that Lincoln, our great friend, would have just embraced the white South right from the beginning and we would have missed all of this Thaddeus Stevens stuff if only Lincoln had lived. I, don't, I think no. that's demented, but anyway, that's one part. Of birth of a it's interesting because I teach the, uh, or I have taught Gone with the Wind. I give a seminar on the memory of the Civil War in American culture, and and a lot of a lot of my female students watch the movie and they what they see is female empowerment in in the character of Scarlet. It's very interesting. I mean, it's it's a whole. A way of looking at this film that... Well, when wait, compared to Ashley, well, who can't even tie his shoes, I mean, God, he's, he's pathetic. Oh, and he was married to that mealy mouth Melanie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we Who's could, the we strongest quote, character in some way? The women actually, are the strongest characters again, by far. Again, female empowerment there. I mean, what she went... There was through. a anyway, hand up sorry, back. Sorry, a hand up. 
how do you account for the passage of the 14th and the 15th amendments if the North is as prejudiced as you said it was? Yeah. And these, these amendments indicate, at least to me, that the government was willing to go out and try to protect African Americans for a while. So it se those two amendments would seem to be really important. Th those amendments are miraculous. And I'll go first here. The, I think the summer of 1865 is critical in understanding why you got to the 14th and 15th Amendment. It's because of the behavior of Andrew Johnson, who first says we're going to make treason will be made odious, and then embraced the former ruling class of the Confederacy. But the actions, the passage of black codes, the attempt to send former top Confederates to Congress, that convinced a lot of the white North, the, okay, the rebels don't know that they were beaten. They're acting as if they didn't lose the war. We're going to have to do more to them. And a lot of that, a lot of the 14th Amendment, when you just don't read the, the most famous first art, when you read on, a lot of that is about punishing former rebels, uh, at least as much as helping African Americans. But one thing that punishes former rebels is helping African Americans because that, but I think the summer of 65 is critical there in, in making people think they just don't get it. They lost and they, they don't get it. And they were in, in an incredible commitment to racial equality and to, uh, to widespread suffrage. But the, the, problem, the problem was this remarkable experiment by the Republican Party, Republican governments throughout the South depended on black votes. They were 70% or 80% of the republic, and they just, it got more and more unpopular to send troops down to the south, even as the army was dwindling, to, in, to interfere in southern elections. And the northern, I mean, this is a democracy, and when the republicans lost the House of Representatives in 1874, it was over. It was over even though President Grant didn't want it to be over, it, but he had to accede, as did the Republican Party, to the, the, and the Northern voters were the same. I mean, they were voting in the Democrats. Well, but, they, but also, I mean, to come back directly to your point, I mean, how committed are you really if you're in a Northern state and you're saying, we're not gonna let black men vote in our state, but we're gonna make Texas have black men vote. Now, is that some great commitment to having black men vote, or is that something else that's going on there? Uh, it is Andrew Johnson, I hate to agree with Andrew Johnson about anything, but his, Joan quoted his comment, he said, what do you, that you want us to, to say that black men have to be able to vote? You won't let them vote. It's been on ballots in a number of your states and you all said no to this. So what is going on with you, Buster Brown, is basically what he's saying. So it's just, I, I wish that, I mean, I wish that the white North had different racial attitudes in the mid 19th century, but they didn't. And you can stand on your head and squint and look sideways and do anything you want, but by our standards, the vast majority, the vast majority of white citizens of the United States in the mid-19th century were extremely prejudiced by our standards. And it's just the way it is. You, we often, there are lots of scholars in here, some new book comes out fairly regularly, you know, looking at some, Indiana, looking at two counties in Indiana and they find out that white people are racist. Wow, what a shock. <laughs> Those are the kind of people who go to the beach and write back, I found sand. <laughs> Call the newspaper. It's just a baseline. Joan gets upset with me. I mean, no. it's a baseline. We have to accept that as a baseline and then deal well, with it. Well, I think what we're saying here, certainly, in the approach to the past uh, is that we shouldn't every time look at an historical event or a historical period and draw it into the present. Um, for example, looking at race and reconstruction and then immediately comparing it to the Black Lives Matter movement and judging it on that. There's, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not really what historians should be doing. It's, it's just using history as a means to an end to get to current affairs. And it's really, um, it's really a challenge to make students feel the satisfying uh, I, I, I endeavor of trying to understand why people acted the way they did in any given historical period. In other words, do you want to learn why people did this or that in the 19th century? Read the sources, get to know the people, try and understand the generation that they were 
born in, not, not the way you think that they should be acting. I think, it's, I think you can actually flip this. To me, it's sort, it is, and I've already said this once, I think it's sort of miraculous that you get the 14th and 15th Amendments from that society. It's sort of miraculous that you get emancipation if you had polled people in 1861 and said, you know, slavery's going to be dead in four years, they'd have looked at you like you were crazy. Slavery was thriving. Slavery had never been thriving more than it was. Abraham Lincoln said it would probably last another 50 years. We would have had the ignominious distinction of being the last place to get rid of slavery. We would have been after Brazil. We would have been after Spanish Cuba because it was working very well here. So you go from that and a group of deep south slaveholding states that decide to disrupt the union to protect slavery, I mean, talk about a miscalculation. Four years later, the thing they wanted to protect is gone. Nobody would have guessed it. It's just amazing how quickly that happened. And to add the 14th and 15th Amendments to that, I think it's remarkable. And of course, if you've studied the Civil War, you know that the, the Southern economy was wrecked. I mean, the, 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 the cotton plantation plantations of old would never come back, would never come back, and, and much of the environment was destroyed that was conducive to uh, cotton growing and rice growing. It, it, so th there was this uh, huge change in both white and black people's lives. It, I mean, what an amazing period to study, just on its own terms. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just something, and there were, I mean, African Americans did stand up for their rights during this whole time and in and into the late 19th and 20th centuries. There were lawsuits filed. There were case courses that went to the Supreme Court, at least were heard. So, and, and there were many, not a great number, but progressive white allies in this, in this cause. It never, it never ended the cause for equal rights and, and civil rights and suffrage. In oh. terms of disruptive, that there is nothing in our modern life that even approaches the power of a cluster of issues relating to slavery to divide people and get people willing. There's just nothing like it. There are things that really divide us, things we get really upset about. There is nothing like the cluster of issues related to slavery. There's just, there's just nothing. Not even Donald Trump. <laughs> not anything. I don't care. I'm not any person, not anything. Whenever people talk, and we have so many people now who talk, especially in the, in the chattering classes, about how this is, we're sort of just like the Civil War. Just stop it. Uh, we are so far from the Civil War. I mean, really, stop it. Stop talking that way. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to other people <laughs> who are talking about that. But I mean, the, the, the contrast is mind-boggling. If you really see what's going on then and see what's going on now. It's, and, and at the root of all of that is the institution of slavery. If you take it out of there, none of this stuff happens. Uh, but with it there, you get all of this stuff that happens. From the very beginning of our founding, I mean, it, yeah, it was an issue. Absolutely. absolutely. You're pointing at someone. Oh, right here. But you didn't even mention the role of the Supreme Court and uh, in Eric Foner's book, The Second Founding, about how the Supreme Court kind of uh, disabled the 14th and 15th Amendments. I mean, they kind of interpreted. In the short term. Yeah. Yes, not in the and, that, the thing about the 14th and 15th Amendments is they don't go away. Yes. They're there, and they're still there. And, but yes, all kinds of things can happen in the interim. But, and we, I mean, we, we talked, we only, to us, this time went by very quickly. For some of you, it may have seemed endless. <laughs> but there's so much to talk about in Reconstruction. Yeah. It's hard to talk, to touch on so many things that are so interesting. It's an unbelievably complicated If everyone period. can stay till midnight, we can cover <laughs> all this. <laughs> oh, there. Yeah. Um, hey, I was wondering, all of this radical Republican legislation that Andrew Johnson vetoed, does he hold the record for the most vetoes by a president of the United States? That's a great question. I have no idea. I, I don't know. I don't know if he holds the record. I mean, I, to, but, but he's, he's in the running. He might have held the record for <laughs> vetoes being overridden. Yeah, for <laughs> overridden. Know. Yeah. yeah that, I don't know that the answer was... to that. But you know what? Anybody with a telephone can answer that before yeah, you right. sit down. Well, leave it to Actually, you. Actually, I'm, I'm got sorry. The I, know, 
no, no, no. I, yeah. I'm sorry. We have a. We he have had a, a lot longer to do it. He had a lot longer to do it. <laughs> we have someone voting here for Cleveland. Oh. Cleveland was number two. Grover Cleveland, a giant. <laughs> In many ways. Yes. Well, this is this. This is why people used to refer to FDR as the Cleveland of his day. Yep. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take the opportunity then uh, of the last question. This has been absolutely wonderful and absolutely fabulous, and I'm so glad we recorded it. Uh, I want to ask a, a question, which I think, Joan, you, you, you m bounced off this idea, so I want you to bounce back to it. And both of you, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Uh, I am currently writing a book which the first premise of every chapter, well, eight out of 10, is that there is sand at the sea, that you have to start from the premise that our history at every period has race as a fundamental element. And I'm struggling as I'm writing this because I'm saying to myself, I don't know any credible historian who would blink twice at that statement, that race is critical and that America has done things based upon its race, and most of them are not ones that necessarily we are proud of. What I'm struggling with is that at the same moment I know there's no historian who would dispute that, I know that there are people who are going to put down my book at the end of every second page of every chapter, or at least after that first premise, saying, I don't want to deal with this subject, I don't want to deal with this guy, that's not the America I want. Expound. Well, how to solve my problem. This sounds like a very personal issue with you. I promise that I will buy it and not put it down and urge everyone else. I don't know what... I'm going to try and get you to elaborate a little. Are you saying that we're still a nation of, of we, that have a lot of racists or lots of deniers who... Well, I, I, yes, obviously, but I, 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 more, more, I, I guess I was hoping to get you to speak to the, the current political moment as historians, and I know that you said that we need to take the, the past on its own terms, but let's take ourselves on our own terms. How do you two as historians deal with the fact that the popular, there is a segment of the popular opinion, as you put it, Gary, often informed by movies, a segment of the popular opinion which is fundamentally at odds with what we historians take as not even contentious issues anymore, no, absolutely. But, but baseline. That, and that's always true. There's no question about it. That that will always that will always be true. And and it and there's nothing that we can. I learned a long time ago. There's nothing you can do about that. But that's my view. You can be reasonable. You can make nice arguments. You can have people read things. You can take. You can do everything you can do. And at the end, they'll say that's interesting. But and then they'll restate. <laughs> the position that with me the the one that I get that the most in in talks is the black confederate one there were a hundred thousand black confederates you know there were 50 and everybody knows this and you're lying when you don't admit that they were there and so forth and so on and you can it doesn't matter what that is a way retrospectively to get the confederacy right on slavery and race and people said just stop trying to do that the Confederates weren't trying to get, I mean, they weren't, they were unabashed about what they were up to. And if you, if you read what they said going forward, it's clear what they're doing. They're protecting their slaveholding society. They weren't embarrassed by that. Retrospectively, they were smart enough to figure out that that's not the way to argue it because they're out of step with Western civilization. So retrospectively, they changed their stances. But you, but some, but it's, it's just, it's, it's baked in. And nobody, everybody isn't going to be, I think that part of the problem, and then I'll stop, is sometimes when you read a book and you, and, and you keep seeing the same point made again and again and again and again and again and again and again, I think some people might think, oh, I've already gotten that. You don't need to keep making that point every single time going through and repeating it and repeating and repeating. I get it. I'm paying attention. I'm reading this. I think there may be some of that, but that doesn't get at the issue you're talking about. It's just the way it is. But every single chapter begins with that. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm ex I was exaggerating a little, but, 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 but it, is, it is a baseline it, it, Don't you think it's improved tremendously just, just in maybe the last 50 years? Some... <laughs> I think part of our, most of our society has improved. I think a large part of our society has actively chosen to go in the other direction. Well, here's the deal. We're dealing with humanoids. 
And, and human beings, they find ways to be divided. They find ways to distance themselves from others and to put themselves above others. There are all kinds of, race works very well there. Religion works very well there. You use whatever tool you want to use and then you do it. I'm serious, that's what human beings do and that's what a lot of history is. And that's, unless we're not I, no, gonna deal I, with humans anymore. But I'm, we're a much different society. We're so diverse now, even more diverse than we were in the 19th century. But, but all I can say uh, um, is that we, we've just got to keep writing the books and, and spreading the good word, I, whatever that is. <laughs> I, have two, I have two folders in my files. One, neo-Confederate hate mail, and one, hate mail calling me neo-Confederate. <laughs> and, and you can, you, no matter what you do, somebody's going to get upset about it. And so they get upset about it, and if you write, as I did in one of the books that Cecily mentioned, that most white Southerners supported the Confederacy and developed a sense of nationalism, then people say, oh, so, you're, so you like the Confederacy. No, I'm saying that most white Southerners developed a sense of, oh, or, anyway, you can well, order, I, call in a slaveholding republic, you get an email, email from some guy in Charleston, which I cherish, that says what I deserve is a virulent form of pancreatic cancer. <laughs> I have that email, it's in my file, and I just think, wow, get Where, life. I just throw away any mail I get that's hate mail or delete it. So well, let me, only keep the good ones. The, the good let ones. Me, so let me, I just have one file. Let me, let me uh, close. <laughs> Let me close then by returning to a point that you just, just made, Gary, that uh, humans are inherently seeking to classify and even separate themselves and divide ourselves. Yes, and I, I would do. like to point out that we established on the way over here that you are a New York Yankees fan. So I've not yeah, listened to anything you've said. Which loser you root for? <laughs> we made it to the World Series. Yes, and we've won 28 World Series. Screw you. <laughs> Wait a minute, I have one thing to say. I have one thing to say. I don't care about the Phillies or the Yankees. I'm a Dodger fan, and I am just thrilled to be able to come to Dallas and be, go through Highland Park, where my hero, Clayton Kershaw, is from. <laughs> thank you so much for well, that. Thank, thank you, you all. Much. This has been wonderful. <laughs>